Okay, so this audio lecture will cover information that's in chapter five, which is the complement system. So the complement system um, is a, another um, process, part of the immune system that really bridges components of adaptive and innate. Um, so in most cases, it's kind of put into the innate category, but um, for the classical pathway, you need an antibody to initiate it. So there's an adaptive component to it, right? So antibodies can be produced by a B cell. So you've had to have seen the antigen before in order for activation of the classical pathway. There is the alternative and the lectin pathway that do not require antibodies. So it does mean you can have activation of complement even if you haven't seen a pathogen before, okay? Um, the other thing with the complement system is, I'm gonna go through it. <laughs> through this audio lecture, um, but definitely during um, our lecture time, we will whiteboard it because it's definitely a technique um, or a process that makes more sense if you can whiteboard the steps, okay, versus just talking through the steps. Okay, so for the complement system, um, it's made up of serum proteins. So these are proteins that are found in circulation in the blood, um, and they're in their inactive form, so a proform. Um, once they become activated, they can um, lead to a different number of outcomes. So when you have activation of the complement um, protein, this could actually target the um, target the cell membrane for lysing, so it'll bind to the cell membrane, and then you'll have initiation of other activation of other complement proteins, so that you'll end up with the cell being lysed. Um, it parts of the complement system, um, so as these proteins become activated, they break down. Some of the components can actually be used for chemotaxis, so you can actually draw um, additional like um, phagocytes to the location. It can also lead to opsonization. So opsonization is where you get this coating of complement over the surface of the bacteria that is with the antibodies binding. And this leads it for um, phagocytes to be able to see so that you get this direct interaction, which will then actually initiate um, phagocytosis. And then also inflammation. So again, some of these factors, um, the um, by products, the breakdown products of um, the complement proteins can act as activating inflammation. Um, so we'll look at that also. So as mentioned, there's three different um, pathways in the complement system. So you have the classical pathway, the lectin pathway, and alternative pathway. So the classical pathway is the one that is uh, more characterized and more um, say routinely used. The alternative pathway would be the next popular one, um, and then the lectin pathway. So in most um, you know, introductory type uh, sections of immunology, so if you're talking about like anatomy and physiology, or even a microbiology course, if you talk about complement, usually you just kind of like forget about the lectin pathway. Um, even in this course, we'll focus a little bit more on the classical and alternative pathway. We'll definitely talk about the lectin pathway more than you would in another course, but even um, within an immunology course, maybe if you were taking advanced topics um, in immunology, you might talk more about lectin, okay? Um, but with all three of these pathways, they're going to generate a complement 3, so complement protein 3B, um, so that gets generated, and so this becomes a kind of common complement um, protein that is found in all three pathways. So they end up merging, if you will, um, at this, and then the end um, effect, the termination of um, the complement system would be could be the same. So this is a nice slide, um, nice figure, because it over gives you an overview of the three different pathways. Um, so again, the classical pathway, this is where we're going to have an antigen antibody complex occurring. So again, we have to have antibodies being produced. So this means B cells would have had to have seen this antigen before um, and then develop antibodies against it. Antibodies are in circulation along with these complement proteins. So if the antigen, if the pathogen it recognizes is found 
in the circulation in the blood, these antibodies can bind to those antigens and then initiate the classical pathway. We then have amplification that occurs by having additional complement proteins being activated and then termination being what's the effect going to happen. So with the classical pathway, we have the antibodies playing a role, but we also have complement protein 1, um, first complement protein Q um, it comes together and binds the antibody. We then have complement protein 1, R, and S complexing in there. Um, so that actually forms a ring that stabilizes the Q complex. So complement protein 1, C1, Q, R, S, is the complex um, that will bind the antibody and then initiate the activation of C2 and C4. This then further gets amplified um, by activation of C3. And then you have um, downstream effects. Okay, So again, um, this is where this process <laughs> complements easier to whiteboard um, than kind of talk through. So just if this, if, if this is confusing, don't worry. We'll talk about it during um, our class time. With lectin, what happens is that you have PAMPs um, recognition by lectins, okay? And so there's lectins, these carbohydrates, on the surface of the bacteria. This gets recognized, and so um, you end up having this Mandos binding lectin. So that's what you see in that green structure. It looks very similar to your C1Q um, complex being formed. And then you have um, MASPs that will bind and they form kind of like the ring that we see with the Q1RS. So they're kind of similar. So again, if, if you look at the basic structure and the complement, the classical pathway and the lectin pathway, um, you can see the similarities in those structures. But again, what they recognize is different. So again, with the classical pathway, the, antibo the antibody has to bind the antigen. With the lectin pathway, it's the binding of the lectin to the carbohydrates that initiates this. Okay, um, and so downstream of those initial complexes, then you have activation of C2, C4, C3, C5, and then downstream. Okay, with the alternative pathway, this spontaneously activates um, through hydrolysis, so there's no um, initiating step that's specific. It's just a spontaneous activation. So the alternative pathway is slow, um, so it doesn't always get activated because otherwise we'd have like C3 becoming activated all the time and that would be a bad thing. Um, we don't want the complement protein, complement pathway to be activated um, unless, um, ideally, unless it's being initiated. But again, sometimes we haven't seen that before or lectin's not involved, so we want this alternative pathway to still be able to deal with pathogens that don't have lectin, um, that ha don't have antigens that we've seen before. So the alternative pathway allows us to deal with that through the spontaneous activation of C3. So what's gonna happen is that C3B is going to then bind, um, it will bind to um, factors like factor B. So you can see how the C3B that was spontaneously activated binds to factor B that's been activated, which is BB. So you have C3BBB, -B -B. <laughs> and then you get this amplification because you have another C3 that gets activated by this. Um, that complex forms, and again, you can then get um, terminal effect occurring. And again, um, this is where these pathways are a little bit easier to understand, um, either in a video format or through whiteboarding and showing the steps occurring. Okay, so again, if any th any of these three um, pathways are, it seems confusing, um, don't worry, that's completely normal. Um, we'll do some activities. We'll look at how um, activation of complement plays a role in COVID, um, and our journal club paper will reinforce um, these concepts um, with the complement pathway, complement system.
So first, I'm focusing on the classical pathway. As I mentioned, um, you have to have antibodies um, to initiate this. Usually these are IgMs or IgGs um, because they can have multivalent um, binding to the antigen. Um, and then this is going to cause C1Q to bind and complex. And then you're going to have your C1RS complex to stabilize that. So again, C1, Q, R, and S ends up forming the C1 complex. And the C1 complex is what's going to be binding to the antibodies and then cause activation of C2 and C4. So as I just mentioned, you know, you're going to get this activation um, of the C1 complex, which then is going to cause activation of C4, then C2, and the activation of those would be that you get a um, C4A um, subunit and a C4B subunit, okay? And same thing with C2, when we get activation, we get an A subunit and a B subunit. Um, what happens is that your C4B and 2A bind together, and this is going to actually form what's known as a C3 convertase. The rule of C3 convertase is to convert C3 into its active form, okay? And so C3 gets activated, and the way it's activated is by cleaving it into C3B and C3A. C3A can go off and cause inflammation, um, can act as a uh, chemo, chemokine. Um, C, C3B stays, um, binds to that C4B2A, and that forms C3 convertase. C3 convertase can convert C3 into an active protein. Um, so you'll get C5B and C5A. Okay. And so again, if all of this goes through, don't worry. <laughs> it's it's when you whiteboard it somehow it just it usually clicks for a lot of students. And I also have videos um, that's again for some students they like the videos um, to understand the concepts of this. Um, this figure I think makes <laughs> usually helps also to visualize this coming together. So again, um, with our classical pathway, we see our antibody binding to the antigen, we see the C1Q coming in, binding the antibody, we then have this ring that's formed by the C1RS um, that stabilizes this complex so that we have now formed our C1 complex. That C1 complex, if we move over to panel two, um, is going to activate C4 so that we have C4B, um, kind of complexing there with the surface. Um, C4, C4A four c is going to go off, um, so it can um, play a role in inflammation um, and also as a chemokine. Um, we're then going to get activation of C2. So C2 is the A form is what stays and binds to the C4B. So we now have C4B2A. That is what is known as C3 convertase for the classical pathway. Um, C2B goes off and again it can act, act as um, chemokine or um, initiate inflammation. So if we now look at panel 3, this is where we have our C3 convertase. This is going to be able to convert C3 and by converting it, we're going to have the formation of C3B and C3A. C3A goes off, but we can also have additional C3Bs um, activated, so some of those will go off and um, play a role in inflammation and also as a chemokine. Some of that C, um, C3B will bind to our C3 convertase and it's going to form a C5 convertase. So just like C3 convertase, its function is to convert C3. The function of C5 convertase is to convert C5. Okay, so as we see in panel four, 
we have our C5 convertase, which is made up of C, 4B, 2A, 3B. It is now converting C5, and you can see how we have C5B and C5A. So C5B will play a role in forming the membrane attack complex, or MAC, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on, so I'm going to say stay tuned to find out what C5B does. Um, C5A, just like our other um, products that kind of go off, can play a role in inflammation or with chemokines. So again, with the classical pathway, um, it's going to be initiated by the antibody binding, but there are checkpoints in it. Um, so when C4 gets cleaved, there's actually a thiol ester bond that is exposed. And so if nothing binds to that um, bond, um, because it's not going to be binding to the target, um, it will actually be hydrolyzed and then it becomes inert. Um, so again, just the idea that there's regulation beyond just antibody binds and we just cascade on, um, there's going to be checkpoints along the way. Okay, and then so for the lectin pathway, it's going to be initiated when we have these soluble proteins that are in the blood and they recognize microbial antigens or they recognize they're gonna, the lectins are going to end up binding to the microbial surface because they recognize the polysaccharides that are on the present on the surface or the carbohydrates that are on the surface. Okay, so the lectins, um, you know, a common one would be mannose binding lectin um, or it's abbreviated MBL. Okay, so um, it will bind to mandose, which is sugar, and it's found on some, some um, microbes. So again, we have the classical pathway that if you have seen it before and you produce antibodies, you can use the classical pathway. We need pathways that if we haven't seen it before, so we have the lectin pathway, um, so it doesn't require that you've seen the microorganism before. Um, it does require that you do have these polysaccharides, yeah, you have mandos present, that the lectins that are in circulation in your blood are, are able to recognize um, those carbohydrates on the surface. Okay, um, So again, just like you have the complement protein, complement protein 1 in circulation, you're going to have these mandos binding lectins in circulation. And so that if there's microbes that move into your blood, um, that you would have a way to deal with those. So what happens is that you have um, the mannose binding lectin or other lectins that are going to bind to these polysaccharides on the surface of the microbes, and then you have stabilizing um, components, proteases, that will bind also. Um, so similar to how with the classical pathway, you have C1RS that forms that ring to stabilize, C1Q, um, you're going to have Maps. Um, so this is um, MBL associated serine protease. Um, so again, they'll bind to the MBL and form this complex that you see. Okay, because they're a protease, um, they can act to cleave C4 and C2, so that you can form C3 convertase. So you would end up with. C4 becoming activated, C2 becoming activated, so then you would have C4B2A, and that would act as C3 convertase. After that, the steps are the same. So again, um, if we compare and contrast complement and leptin, um, those initiating steps, what's doing the initiation, the recognition, is different. Um, structurally, they, there's similarities on how they look, right? Um, but once we get these activations of these down, kind of downstream complement proteins, C4 and C2, we form that C3 convertase. Um, so we have um, C3B being formed, um, and then we would end up having C, um, after we have C3 convertase, we end up having C5 convertase, and then we can have a membrane attack complex, and again, we'll talk about that um, shortly. Now, looking at um, the alternative pathways, there's three different ways in which this can um, be initiated. Um, so the three different initiation pathways for the alternative is, they're known as um, alternative 
over tick over pathway, alternative propidine activation pathway, and alternative protease activation pathway. And if again, if you took if you learned about complement, you would just would have learned there's an alternative pathway. <laughs> So for the alternative tick over pathway, what happens is that there's always going to be small amounts of C3 that gets activated, but if it doesn't bind to anything, it actually gets inactivated quickly. Um, so what happens is that the activated C3B ends up binding something. Um, and when it binds it, then we have these other complement proteins that are instead of being called C something, they're factors. Um, so factor B will bind. and um, it's going to get cleaved by factor D. So then we end up with the C3BBB complex on the membrane. And this is going to act as C3 convertase. Um, Propidine can stabilize the C3 convertase um, because we don't have those other components there to help to stabilize it. So we don't have your C1 complex and we don't have um, our lectin. Um, in our serine proteases present. So propidine helps to stabilize it so that we can get more C3 to be cleaved so that we can then have um, the newly activated C3B binding um, our C3 convertase so we can form C5 convertase. So with alternative pathway, C5 convertase is a little different um, because we don't have the activation of C2 and um, C4. So our C5 convertase is going to be C3B, BB, C3B. <laughs> okay, so um, it's okay to chuckle nervously and say, how am I going to remember this? Uh, again, remember the similarities, remember the big picture pieces, right? So the, the idea here is the alternative pathway. We have a formation of C3 convertase, a little bit different um, than what we see acting as a C3 convertase for the classical and for our lactin. Um, but it still acts, it has the same function, it converts C3, it activates C3, and so that once that's activated, it's going to bind, and so then we get C5 convertase. Same function as the other C5 convertases, and so it's going to cleave um, C5 so that we get the C5B and the C5A being formed. Okay. Now we can also have where propidine actually is going to directly bind to the surface and then it can recruit in C3B and factor B to form that C3 convertase, okay? Um, after you get that C3 convertase forming, um, the steps would be identical to the tick over pathway. So again, the difference, the tick over pathway um, activation is happening and propidine is stabilizing those activations where with this um, pathway we actually have propidine actually activating the pathway and then lastly as an alternative way um, we can have proteases activating um, spontaneously um, so this is where we can have clotting um, cascades causing the initiation um, and so um, this is where with some of the infectious diseases, viruses um, like COVID, seeing um, clots forming um, can lead to the activation of complement, which then can further cause cellular damage. Okay, um, so we'll look at clotting. Um, you know, probably in part of the Journal Club paper, um, looking at COVID and complement activation. Um, and we'll talk more about it later on. Um, but what happens is thrombin will end up cleaving C3 in C5. Um, it can do this in vitro. Um, and this can lead to platelet activation. Um, with platelet activation, you get release of ATP, uh, calcium ions, um, serine, therine, kinases and that's what could stable can end up stabilizing the C3B um, and so the company with this is 
you get a really strong inflammatory response, um, and that ends up um, activating complement. And so again, this is um, this protease activation pathway, um, coupled coupling this with clotting and activation of complement is a um, big area um, that's being focused on for uh, treatment of COVID because they're seeing with COVID um, patients are more likely to develop clots and with that again you can act get activation of complement so one of the areas um, that they're looking at for therapies for drugs is preventing clots but also preventing complement activation. With complement activation, one of the um, you know terminal goals <laughs> is to have formation of the membrane attack complex, abbreviated MAC. Um, and so, with these three complement pathways, when you have um, C5 convertase, C5 is going to then generate, initiate the generation of membrane attack complex, so that you'll end up getting that C C5B complexing with C6, C7, C8, and C9 um, on the target cell, the pathogen, the microbes, membrane. What happens is they, the membrane attack complex creates a pore, a hole, and this is going to disrupt the ability to regulate um, osmotic pressure and so it's going to end up leading to cell death and the other thing is it's not that the you know complement is only happening once so we're going to talk about it like you know we talk about it like okay one antibody binds an antigen and then you get one c1 complex and then you get the it, it's happening you know a thousand time over on the cell and so you get that like hundreds thousands of these membrane attack complexes so you actually end up getting these like plaques these areas where they're forming um and so again the it's too much for the cell for the microbe to actually um handle so looking at the membrane atta attack complex again you have this activation of c5 so c5b forms on the um on the cell membrane. Um, you then have C, C6, 7, and 8 coming together. Um, and these kind of complex together. And then you have um, C9, and you have with C9, there's multiple C9s that come in. Um, and, you know, in the old textbooks, it was six, and that was it. Um, but it, um, through high resolution um, electron microscopy, um, what they have found is that. It, the number of C9s can vary, so you can get anywhere from 6 to like 20 of these C9s complexing together, and that can change the size of the pore, okay, so the size of the membrane attack complex. Um, so what you're looking at here are some images um, that have been created through a technique called cryo-electron microscopy. Um, so this is electron microscopy done at extremely low temperatures, um, so like negative 120 degrees Celsius. Uh, I don't know what that works out to Fahrenheit, but it's wicked cold. <laughs> uh, and so what happens is when you take cells and their membranes and you put them in this really cold temperature, all the molecules freeze and they stop moving. Um, and so if we think about cells and membranes at room temperature, they're moving. Um, and if we just put them in like a normal freezer, there's still a lot of wiggle, and when molecules wiggle, and we're using microscopes to look at that, um, it kind of causes an unclear image, okay? And so by super chilling the membranes and slowing these molecules down, we're able to get a higher resolution image of what's going on with these individual molecules. And then what we can do is use gold labeling, and we can label the different components. So we can gold label, um, just the C5B, um, just the C9s, and then we can get an idea of um, how these molecules are coming together by overlaying this information. And I can post um, the article that does this beautifully and looks at these interactions. And so back, you know, even just five years ago, what we thought was that these initial um, complement proteins that were coming in to form the membrane attack complex were actually in the hole <laughs> and were left the hole. Um, so we thought that C5B 
B, six, seven, and eight formed, and I used to say, a munchkin in the middle, and then the munchkin would come out, and then you'd have this donut hole form. Well, that's not what's actually happening, and through cryomicroscopy, what we saw, that, what, what the researchers that did the techniques saw, was that these components actually stayed, and they actually formed kind of the outside, like one of the sides, and then the C9s lined up around there. So the C5B, as you can see there, with six and seven forms like a stalk and then you have the ring that forms with eight kind of initiating the ring and then the nines c nines coming in around it okay but that whole structure ends up being your membrane attack complex so again if you have an older textbook just be aware that um, what you're looking at at the figures may be a little bit different and that's because there's this newer research um, that has come out that has been able to look at um, really how these interactions occur. Okay. So when we look at um, the three main classes of complement activity um, as host defense. Um, there's going to be the innate defense against infection. Um, so we can get lysis of bacterial and cell membranes through the formation of membrane attack complex. We can also get opsonization. Um, this is where we're going to have C3B and C4B binding to the surface and this actually tells fa um, phagocytes to engulf them to engulf these the these um, microbial cells or cells that have been labeled with the C3B C4B complexes. We can also get the initiation of inflammation and chemotaxis um, by some of these A subunits. So C3A and C5A, uh, known as anaphylactic toxins, um, and the receptors to uh, leukocytes can actually cause their activation so we get inflammation. Okay, there's also the interfacing between the innate and adaptive immunity. Um, so we have our antibody response and that antibody response by the B cells um, can affect um, what pathway of complement is being utilized. Um, so um, we also, because you're going, if you use those antibodies, um, there's going to be more memory um, built in because if you have good antibodies, those B cells will persist and you'll have memory populations. We can also get um, some of the components causing um, uh, enhancement, um, better antigen um, presentation. So if we have um, C1Q or C3B or C4B or C5A present or our Mandos um, binding lectin, um, it will actually signal to cells to um, present the antigen, right? So it's like we've seen this, it activated a complement, we better go show this to the T cells and B cells. Um, and with that, we can also get potential effects on the T cell populations. Okay. Um, and with complement, um, we see complement in the contraction phase of the immune response. And what that means is that when we're clearing out um, damaged tissues, um, it, the complement activity is going to play a role in that. And so clearance of immune complexes from tissue, um, complement path pathways are going to allow for that to happen. Also clearance of um, cells that have undergone, undergone apoptosis. So you can have those um, signals that, you know, hey, you need to engulf me. Um, and so your complement can be utilized in order to do that. And also we can get induction of regulatory cells. Um, so um, complement can play a role in that. So those complement proteins um, can have a diverse function. So there's that function of being able to produce um, 
the membrane attack complex, um, but they can also end up causing uh, fact, um, effector cells to become activated. Um, so we can have complement receptors that are found on some uh, some of our immune cells um, that can again by, can sense um, the complement protein portions, um, and they can act. Those po complement proteins can act as ligands. Um, to bind to those receptors and then cause um, activation of those cells or initiation of processes. So the, um, this table, which is on a couple of slides, um, just shows you some of the receptors. So you have these complement protein receptors or CR, so CR1. Um, and, and so again, um, if you look at the different ligands, these ligands would be components of the complement um, pathway. And you can see that the different cells that will express it, and so there's a number of different um, leukocytes, both um, looking at like macrophages and neutrophils and xenophils, and, but also our T cells and B cells that will produce those. And again, the function of those are usually going to be activating of the cells. And if we're talking about phagocytes, um, helping them um, be better phagocytes um, than they were before. So again, just some additional receptors and their ligands and what cells are expressed on them. So just looking at some of the receptors, um, C1 receptor, this is found on leukocytes and also erythrocytes, red blood cells. Um, so when it's found on the red blood cells, it's going to help to bring immune complexes to the liver to clear it. So keep in mind that your liver is a site of detoxification and a great site for your immune cells um, to make sure that those toxins are removed through the process of phagocytosis, and so loop, um, red blood cells uh, can bind those and um, bring them for clearance. For phagocytes, um, this is going, having the C1 um, receptors are going to allow the phagocytes um, to bind to those complement coated um, bacteria. So then that allows them to ingest, undergo the process of phagocytosis and destroy those pathogens. Um, our complement receptor 1 on B cells help, helps that, them to bind um, the antigens so that we get enhanced um, processing and presenting to T helper cells. For complement receptor 2, CR2, when it's found on B cells, it's going to end up binding to C3B, as we can see in the figure there. Um, and this can lead to opsonization of the bacteria or antigens. Um, so it can help to stabilize the interactions between the B-cell receptor, the antibody structure there, the antigen, and then um, our um, C19. Um, so that again, that we get this good secondary signal that occurs. And we'll talk more about the, um, the activation of the B-cell receptor complex um, later on in the semester. But just keep in mind that... Um, complement protein, complement receptor 2, CR2, allows to stabilize that. C3A receptor and C5A receptor um, is found on granular sites. So keep in mind with granular sites, we're talking about um, xenophils, neutrophils, basophils. Um, within that, we also have our mast cells and macrophages. And so um, those are going to be able to, that those receptors would be able to sense um, the C3A or C5A that's being released when it's being broken down. And so um, this is going to lead to cells that are going to have, you know, histamine in them to degranulate and release the histamine. Um, it's going to work as a chemotaxis, so they're going to actually be drawn to the location of that. And so very much these um, act almost as pro-inflammatory, um, releasing cytokines and, again, whatever components are in their granules. And, again, you can think of histamine being released.
So with complement, again, we can get enhanced host defense against um, infection. So this can be through the MAC-induced um, cell death, but we can also have promotion of inflammation, promotion of opsonization. So here in this figure, you see how um, this bacteria um, has these complement proteins on its surface, the C3B, and that causes the phagocyte to engulf it. Okay, um, Or we can have antibodies that label it, and because we have receptors that are going to recognize those antibodies on the phagocyte, the FC portion of it, um, it would be able to then bring that in and destroy them. Okay. And then again, with the interface between the innate and the adaptive immunities, um, this is where we can get enhanced antigen uptake. And if we get that, we're going to get in increased presentation because then we're going to get that um, the APCs then presenting to our B cells and our T cells, right? Um, which can lead to an enhanced B cell response um, so that we get better antibodies being produced, which then just furthers um, additional complement activation of the classical pathway. We can also get lysing of immature T cells um, so that um, they wouldn't, they're actually being kind of deselected for um, through that process. And again, we'll talk about more about the, that process later on in the semester when we talk about T cell development. We can also get binding of the C3A, C5A, and C3B um, to the receptors that are found on mature T cells, and this would actually facilitate their growth, differentiation, and survival. So again, talk, we'll talk more about that as it deals with the T cell and their development later on in the semester. Um, again, with complement, this is going to play a critical role in the clearing of um, apoptotic cells and the pieces of them, the fragments of them that are left behind. And we also need to make sure that we're clearing out any of these immune complexes. So again, if you have antibodies in the circulation and they come, um, as they're moving in circulation, they're coming in contact with antigen, these immune complexes need to be um, removed and so complement helps in assisting that process because it's going to help to initiate phagocytes um, to engulf material and such. Okay. So there's a number of steps for regulation with complement activation. So one of the things is that um, many of these have a short half-life. Um, so um, C3 convertase um, has a short half-life unless it's stabilized for, by propidine and so again that's why propidine becomes very important especially when we have spontaneous activation of C3. Okay. Um, self cells, our own cells, also possess different carbohydrate structures um, than um, microbes and so that means that those proteases aren't going to be able to activate um, and break down our own cells readily. And so our cells are actually able to inactivate the C3B um, and actually protect our cells in, in that way. And there's also numerous um, regulatory proteins that help to prevent um, complement, the complement system from actually harming our cells, um, our self cells. So um, again, looking at some of these um, regulatory proteins, one that um, you should be familiar with is the C1 inhibitor, right? So it's actually going to cause um, the dissociation of C1RS from binding to C1Q. Um, so you can't get that C1 complex, and if C1 complex doesn't form, you can't get activation of C4 and C2, et cetera, downstream. Okay. There's also the decay accelerating um, factor, DAF, um, and so this will actually um, accelerate the dissociation of C3 convertases. Um, so if you don't have C3 convertase on the membrane, um, you don't get the conversion of C3 
so thus you wouldn't get the formation of C5 convertase and downstream events wouldn't happen. Um, complement protein, complement receptor 1, CR1, can also um, act as a regulator, so it can actually block the formation um, or it can in, it can block the formation or acceleration, accelerate the dissociation of C3 convertase also. There's additional ones, um, so such things as like factor H and factor I um, that can play a role, but definitely you should know um, complement protein 1, C1 inhibitor, and decay accelerating um, factor. So these are just some of the additional ones. Um, so again, in this figure, just focusing on panel A and panel B, because those are the ones you should definitely know. Um, so you can see how um, if you have um, C1 inhibitor, um, it would actually not allow for the association of C1, Q, and CR, S. Okay? With the um, decay accelerating, um, factor, um, it would just um, dissociate um, the subunits that are making up your um, C3 convertase. So I'm going to skip over the, these slides just because I've already talked about these. Um, they just show you um, the figures showing this the dissociation of the C1 components. Um, and just noting that this inhibitor is actually going to bind the active site of the serine proteases so that they're not going to be able to um, cleave C4 and C2. And with DAF, um, DK accelerating factor, again, um, it's going to cause a dissociation of the components that make up the C3 convertase um, so that you're not able to convert C3. There are additional factors in the next couple slides, and I'm not going to um, go through them, just in the interest of time, um, but definitely if you have an interest in one of them, um, you could focus on those. And each one of these, um, you could have knockout mice that would look at them in their roles. So um, carboxypeptidases um, are interesting because they're actually going to um, inactivate um, these um, anaphylactic toxins, so C3A and C5A. So um, as I kind of just alluded to, there's a number of different mouse models um, that can be utilized to look at complement deficiencies. Um, there are natural... Um, mutations um, that are found in you know the human population um, so we know that if you have a defect in complement activation you're going to be more prone um, to infections and um, you're going to have poor clearance of these pathogens um, and cells that are damaged that need to be removed and so because of the in inadequate clearance again you'd be more prone to infections um, with some of the mannose binding lectin deficiencies, they may actually have a higher frequency of infections by um, encapsulated bacteria because they have poor um, opsonization and phagocytosis. Because um, for, for encapsulated bacteria, um, those are going to have the mannose, so these lectins would play a role in their removal. So just like you know, the complement protein, the complement uh, system gives us an added benefit because we have this kind of like backup mechanism and way to clear bacteria. Um, this is a process that is being utilized every single time you brush your teeth because when you brush your teeth, you cause micro tears. Bacteria from your mouth gets into your blood. Um, the vast majority of us do not develop an infection after brushing our teeth, um, and so it's because of complement proteins in our circulation in our serum that actually um, takes care of that bacteria before it can get and get somewhere and cause an infection okay um, and so uh, so again as we've developed we have this system that um, is beneficial to us microbes are going to come come up with ways to try to evade our best um, 
you know, assets are best strategies. And so they have invasion strategies also. Um, so some of them are going to interfere with the first step. So it actually will block the antibodies from being able to bind. Um, so there's a number of different um, parasites, especially like perzoans, that are actually able to change their coat proteins. So the proteins that are found on the surface. And so they go through this normal kind of like routine of changing up their coat proteins so that, you know, even if you're, you're producing antibodies against them, the coat proteins change enough that those antibodies are no longer um, effective, so they will they wouldn't actually cause complement activation. Um, microbes can also produce proteins that will bind or inactivate complement proteins, um, so that you know just like we're producing um, proteins like inhibitors to regulate the complement system, there you can also produce proteins that can block. Um, bind and inactivate them too. Microbes also can have proteases that will actually destroy the complement proteins um, and then some proteins will actually mimic or bind complement regulatory proteins so that you're not able to regulate um, complement. Okay. So again this just outlines some of the different uh, microbes and their strategies and so some of those microbes you know streptococcus um, pseudomonas um, staphylococcus aureus um, have ways in in order to kind of avoid the complement system um one of I, you know i for a lot of these um chapters i have you know evolutionary slides and so it's always interesting to look at how the immune system kind of has evolved um, from different organisms and so with the complement system um, it's a pretty conserved um, system um, so the genes for complement are found in five families the alternative pathway genes are actually the ones that um, first appear in evolution and then the classical and alternative are quote unquote um, the classical and lectin are the newer pathways. Okay, so just looking at some of the different um, animal groups, um, as you can see, the alternative pathways in found, found in all the ones on our graph, but the classical pathway um, is not um, prevalent in all of them. And then lectin pathway is found in all of them, but um, for the ectoderms, um, not as well known. And there's some question marks there with the membrane attack complex. And then not all organisms um, produce the same, have the same ability to produce antibodies. Um, so again, that would um, affect their ability. So just in summary, the complement system serves many purposes. Um, one of those is to link innate and adaptive immune, uh, immune responses. So yes, phagocytosis, we see phagocytes becoming antigen presenting cells, so we have a link there. But also with complement, especially um, when we're talking about the classical pathway, we have the antibody production by the B cells, and without that, you wouldn't have the initiation for the classical pathway. It's important to remember that the complement um, system is tightly regulated, um, that there are regulatory proteins um, that control the process, but the process in itself by having these proforms and they need to be activated and cleaved and sub only some subunits are utilized and the next subunit has to be cleaved in order for you to progress really allows it to be tightly controlled. Okay. Um, and also we can use um, different models um, in order to study it because it's so conserved through evolution. And so, and also lastly, with understanding the system and its methods of activation and regulation it helps us to better understand innate immunity and evolution. All right, so I'm sure there's gonna be plenty of questions on this. Um, it's extremely overwhelming. There's those key slides that um, that show, you know, the um, classical alternative and lectin pathway on the one slide. That's a really um, helpful slide to step through. Um, it's a process that it really is helpful to write out um, 
multiple times, quiz yourself, what's initiating the process? What's the next step? What's the next step? What's the next step? Um, and so it's just something you really need to sit down with and practice, practice. And it, it is a bit of memorization, but it's kind of the thing, the trick is to think about what's similar between them. So memory and attack complex is the same, right? So I actually, I find it helpful to work backwards. So get the memory and attack complex so that you're, you understand it, what are the pieces to make it, what starts it, what's make, making up the stock, what's making up the ring. All right, I feel comfortable that, well, how do I get to that point? Well, I need to have C5 convertase. All right, well, how do I make C5 convertase? What are my options? Okay, well, I need C3 convertase. What are my options? And so again, I, I think sometimes that working backwards because the similarities, um, the overlap, the convergence um, happens right around that C3 convertase. Um, and so if you kind of, um, I think for me, I always found it like more helpful to like, okay, understand membrane attack complex and then work backwards and then say, okay, well, how do I get to the classical pathway? How do I get to the alternative pathway? How do I get to the lectin pathway? Okay. Um, and again, um, applying this to the real world is looking at different um, pathogens, both viral and bacterial, and how does um, complement protein assist and help the innate and the adaptive in their response.